Hello, happy Friday. It is me, Dan Shipman. The coding train has pulled into the station. It had a few delays, but it's here right now. It's Friday. That means it's a day for the coding train. I know this because it actually says this in my calendar now. Um, in fact, uh, I don't know if you know this, but if you put an all day event in a Google calendar, then 10 minutes to midnight the night before, it starts like blinking and blaring and alerting you that the coding train is starting when actually I should be sleeping. But I'm here um, and I am super, uh, 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 I'm, I'm a little bit more excited than usual. I'm usually quite excitable, but today I'm extra excited. Uh, I am going to take the day to attempt to accomplish something that I have been attempting, that I have attempted before, uh, for, uh, and it didn't go very well. And I think I've rethought it, I've rethought about it a little bit. So today, I'm really going to try to take a lot of the work that I've been doing up until now on building a simple neural network in JavaScript and apply it to an actual, possibly almost maybe a little bit useful problem. So I will get to that in a little bit. Uh, and I'm gonna talk about what it is I'm going to do when I get there. This is not a two, it is a kitty cat. Um, okay, so, ah, but before, <clears throat> let me get, let me talk about some logistics stuff. And by that I don't mean the logistic function. <laughs> anyway, um, so today, today it is now about 10.40 a.m. I'm actually only gonna be here for an hour or so to start. I'm gonna try to do the first piece of this project that I'm gonna to build today. And I'm really just gonna prepare the data set. So this morning's gonna be about preparing a data set. I will get to what that is in a moment. Um, and then I will be gone for some meetings and some lunch and some other things. And then I will be back, if I had to guess, around 3 p.m. Eastern time. And then I will be live streaming again from maybe 3 to 5.30. So we'll get maybe an hour, an hour and a half in this morning and two, <laughs> oh God, <laughs> two, two and a half hours in um, this afternoon. Uh, and so the main project, just to get to it right now, the main project that I'm going to do is I'm going to try, I'm going to do a twist on the usual um, MNIST um, uh, machine learning demonstration. M, um, the MNIST data set is a well-known handwritten uh, digit uh, data set that is used to test different machine learning algorithms to demonstrate how machine learning works. It's kind of the, if you will, hello world problem of machine learning. And I'm going to attempt to make a, 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 a similar demonstration but with a creative twist using the uh, Google Quick Draw data set. Um, and so we will attempt, instead of uh, recognizing digits, we will attempt to recognize things like um, hand-drawn little uh, kitty cats. <laughs> uh, but let, let's just see how this is going. Yeah, it's pretty good, two. This has gone around some improvement. Ah, oh, pretty good, three. Well, it even knows I'm gonna draw four. It's like, this is predictive machine learning. Uh, no, 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 uh, we'll get there eventually. Uh, eight, I could do this all day. Uh, all right, um, so, uh, <laughs> looking at the chat, looks like people are watching and not complaining, that's always a good sign. Um, all right, so before I get to any of that, let me talk about a few other things. Summer of Code. This is happening. I am not an official represent, rep, representative of the Google Summer of Code. I am just telling you about it. Uh, this is a summer program funded and managed at, by Google. Uh, where you, if you are a student, um, obviously read and check the eligibility requirements specifically on their website, but loosely if you are a college or graduate student and you will still be a student, even if you graduate this year, you are eligible to apply. Uh, Google will pay you a stipend if you are accepted to contribute to an open source project. 
All the guidelines are on the websites. One of the reasons why I mention this is if I go under view organizations, there are many, many, many wonderful organizations. I encourage you to click through them all and if you're thinking about applying. And also, by the way, if you're not a student, you could potentially be a mentor for one of these projects. That's a slightly different process, but that's something that you could absolutely look into and do. And if I scroll all the way down here, at some point, I will get to the Processing Foundation. So the Processing Foundation, as you might be familiar with if you've watched any of my uh, YouTube channel before, is a not-for-profit organization that I uh, help to manage and run. Uh, it is the organization that maintains the software projects, processing, processing.py, Python processing, and uh, P5.js. The Processing Foundation also um, has a lot of community and education, uh, initiatives around um, inclusion and um, accessibility and so you can read more about the Processing Foundation on the Processing Foundation website but here if you would you, we can go here we can do learn more and now if you are interested uh, I proposals don't start being accepted till March 12th uh, if you are interested here you can click through and uh, Chat, I think, will take you to the, it's not actually a chat, it'll take you to the processing forum. You can post your ideas. Probably the most important thing for you to click on if you're interested in contributing to processing, and by the way, every open source organization that's participating in Google Summer of Code will have this kind of ideas list. If I click here, oh, I've got a cable making a black smudge again. Fascinating. That's not just a smudge. Oh, yeah. Okay, hold on. I'll fix that in a second. Let me go with my, I've got momentum here. I'm all talking about Google Summer of Code. So if I click here, we get to this uh, project list and you can start to read back. Let me just tell you about something that I'm, oh, so one thing, improving file I.O. methods. This is actually something, I, I gotta fix that now. I, now that I've seen it, I gotta fix that. So what that is, if you're wondering, if I bring my finger all the way up to here, see this? This is actually a light. I can shine it on me. Oh, look how bright I am, ah, it's blinding. And uh, where it's sitting, it's kind of the camera is seeing it. So I got to move it over. Yes, I am a one person show here. Uh, <laughs> I think that's better now. There's a giant mouse. Uh, now my shoe is untied. It's poking me. Oh, 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 it's poking me. Okay. Now my shoe is untied, I have to tie my shoe. I was saying something important. Ah, um, one thing I'm gonna do today, in this morning in particular, is I am going to implement a method to load a binary file, a binary data file into P5.js. That is something that is not currently part of the library, so that's one thing. But here's my, this is my pet project <laughs> that I'm really, uh, actually, so I haven't talked about the P5.js web editor on this channel. Uh, coming soon, mm, now look. It's all noisy over here. Mm, I've got to fix that somehow. See, I think I had the light positioned in a way that the green, uh, hmm, oh, cause this, there's this pole here. Hmm. Maybe we just have to live with this today. Is that better? Ah, it looks a little bit better. I mean, I've got a little bit more shadow with me, but that's fine. All right. Um, there's a web editor for P5, it's an ongoing project. You're welcome to uh, look into it. I hope to do, uh, help facilitate some videos about all the people who have made this. I am not included in that list. Wonderful uh, people, Cassie Tarakasian is the lead developer of this project. But without uh, going too far into this, um, um, having a, 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 a piece that could be a nice Google Summer of Code project is making a nicer uh, error console in that web editor itself. So if you are a web developer with experience with maybe, I don't even know if you know. Anyway, <laughs> go look at this stuff. Uh, lots of other things here, uh, all that you, can, that you can scan over. Okay, so I don't wanna, um, I don't want to go um, uh, too far. So actually, let me see. Does anybody, is the sound low? And Let me know if the sound's low. If, and does anybody have any questions about the Google Summer of Code, um, about Google Summer of Code? And let me again be clear, I am not an official representative of Google. Uh, I am someone who has applied to Google Summer of Code as part of the processing organization. So I'm just giving you my perspective on the program and how we manage it from the processing side. Um, is Summer of Code free? Summer of Code is not only free, you get paid. How you get paid depends, I think, where you live, um, but it is open to uh, 
um, students in a certain number of countries that uh, Google is able to uh, have eligible and all that's on the website. Um, all right, all right. Um, okay, so now, hmm. ah, other thing I wanted to say. Okay, so I wasn't here last Friday. Why was I not here? Well, I have to show you my most prized possession in the world. It's in my wallet. Does it have any, I don't think, it doesn't have any personal information on it really. So I don't think I'm, uh, I don't think, you know, I'll, I'll cover up the barcode. So you, this is my, and you probably can't even see this, this is my new most prized possession. It's a nice little picture of me. I got it on February 23rd, 2020. Oh, no, 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 that's not when I got it. <laughs> that's when it no longer will be valid. It is a Library of Congress reader card. So I had this wonderful chance uh, last week to go and visit the Library of Congress. Uh, Jer Thorpe is doing a uh, residency there. If you're not familiar with Jer's work, he does wonderful, amazing stuff in the world of data visualization. You know, that's probably not the, the best way to describe it, but that's a quick way I can describe Jer's work. Um, uh, and uh, he is doing a residency at the Library of Congress Labs. So this is labs.library of Congress, and I would encourage you, uh, first of all, uh, you know, I suppose you have to be uh, living here in these United States, which comes with its problems, trust me. I don't know, I don't know if I would recommend that, but um, Library of Congress is open to the public. Anybody can go and get that reader card. I, oh, this afternoon I will come and show you. I was able to, I got a look at the papers of the mathematician Lorenz of the Lorenz Attractor, and I have, I took photos of his overhead projector slides from his lectures, which are really awesome. I will show them to you. There is so much stuff at the Library of Congress, and it's not all digitized. You have to go there, and you can go there and research. The li libraries are like my favorite thing in the world, and the Library of Congress is probably the biggest library I've ever been to now. Um, but I, I want to mention this. I would encourage you to check out the experiments. These are projects that people are doing with Library of Congress data. Here is information about uh, innovator in residence, Jared Thorpe. He is doing a live podcast. He has a podcast that you should listen to that I've been, that, that's wonderful, I've been listening to. And he's going to do a live one. I don't know, check his Twitter feed for information about that. But in particular, I want to go to LC for robots. And so this is a place where you can find um, all sorts of APIs and available data. So at some point, uh, I, I'm really open to your suggestions and ideas. I would love to make some videos and, and experiment with some of the content and data that's available from the Library of Congress. And then I wanted to find the Congressional Data Challenge. I wanted to mention that. Let's just go to LC Labs on Twitter, because maybe it's a, uh... oh look. <laughs> There, there's a little tweet here about the Lorenz papers, and um, probably because this has to do with, oh yeah, this has to do with a thread about uh, Jer's project uh, with the Lorenz attractor that he's going to demonstrate. Anyway, I, I, I went off topic here. I mean, I'm not off topic, but I wanted to find, um, oh yeah, they're retweeting me, so this is perfect. Uh, this is what I want to look for. So this is the Congressional Data Challenge. Uh, I, uh, obviously, I, you, must, uh, you probably need to read through whatever FAQ to find out who's eligible to apply. But there is a $5,000 first prize and a $1,000 prize for best high school project. Enter by April 22nd, 2018. Especially if you are a high school student. I mean, I'll help anybody if I can. But if you are a high school student and you want to enter this and I can help you somehow, I don't know, get in touch, let me know. Um, there's some example projects, and you can read all about uh, data visualization, data mashup. If I had, if I, if I wasn't on the train that I'm on right now, <laughs> I would love to do, uh, if I could sort of figure out a way to do a, like a tutorial of this stuff, but um, someday. All right. Um, <laughs> no, my birthday is not February 3rd. You can find my birthday online pretty easily. I can also just tell you what it is. And it's July 29th. Dark Shader in the chat says, I am 14 years old. Richard Barton writes, my high school students love Coding Train. Um, I have discovered recently that there's an audience of people most around the age, ages between, I would say like 13 and 17 who are in high school who do watch my videos, which is kind of like amazing to me. Uh, I eat Legos, which, is that really your name, I eat Legos? And also, do you really eat Legos? Because if they were like 
chocolate Legos or like kale, like some sort of like healthy, um, you know, dried kale with hemp seeds, Legos, sustainable, eco, biodegradable, edible Legos. This is a project. Goodbye. I'm going to now invent edible Legos. I will be back. No, I won't because I can't do anything unless it involves JavaScript, and even that I can't do very well. All right. Uh, da -da 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 -da. Let's begin. I think this was everything I wanted to say about of, of a way of introduction to today. But I better get started. All right. So now I'm going to get. Let's. Oops. Let me turn this camera on. Um, oh, oh, I know. There was something else I wanted to do. All right. So I, I wanted to do one other thing before I get started with today's project. And that is, uh, let me go to a website. Let me go to thecodingtrain.com. So if you aren't aware, brand new website. Thank you, Niels Webb. Thank you also to Austin, who's been doing a lot of work uh, that's not yet. Well, some work that's now here in DesignWise and some stuff that's coming. This is a, uh, I see this as a community project. If you're interested in contributing and helping make this website better, uh, check out, uh, just click over to GitHub and check out the GitHub issues. And the, there's lots of ways you can contribute, even if you don't know how to code, just helping write documentation and explanation for how things work or thinking through how the navigation should be to more easily find videos, all that sort of stuff. Um, so the latest, oh, interesting. Oh yeah, I guess, who knows how this, I ended up releasing this stuff. But um, the latest uh, challenge that I did last week, and I, sh I just want to mention, if you're a kind of live stream only viewer, is that a thing? <laughs> I, don't know. I don't know if that's a thing. Like, oh, I just watch the live stream so I don't bother to watch the edited videos. Um, this part four was actually not done on a live stream. So if you're a live stream only viewer, you have not seen this unless you are a patron of the coding train every once in a while pretty rarely if i have like an extra thing that i want to like quickly do and um, i will do a, a, a live stream um, just with the smaller uh, patron group and so I, I just did this part four i'm not hiding any content because it will get released but sometimes it's easier just to do a smaller group live stream to sort something out um, so uh, that is there for you to watch now what i want to do then is go to coding challenges, uh, go to, I think, so one thing that's a little confusing, what I want to do now is show you some community contributions, uh, some community uh, variations of 2048. Um, and well, it's a little bit tricky because this is one thing I haven't really resolved yet. Because it's a four part coding challenge, there's four, um, there's four videos here. Ah, let me mention something. Um, sorry, time, time out, I know I'm scatterbrained. Welcome to watching the coding train. I just saw there was a super chat. I don't really, see, I, I do see the super chats after, but I'm not paying super close attention the way that I have my interfaces set up. Maybe I need a better system. So um, uh, I do want to mention that my preferred way for you to support the channel is through the through Patreon. But of course, it's I, I, I very much appreciate super chats, and I'm going to check this one right now. Um, just since I'm talking about it. I am currently active duty Air Force and want to get into coding but can't go to a school. What is a great starting point? I also live in DC. Awesome, wow, great to hear from you. Thank you very much for your kind uh, super chat message. Um, this is a great question. I mean, uh, on the one hand, <laughs> you know, I'm, it's, I'm hopeful that my, uh, uh, my YouTube channel itself can be a place for you to start. Um, I would say though probably as much as, you know, I could, I could keep listing like, well, there's this other YouTube channel, there's this wonderful book, there's this online tutorial, you know, Code Academy has interactive learn to code tutorials. So I could keep going with those recommendations and I'm happy to help collect them or, or pass them off. But I would say probably the most important thing for you is try to find a local community, uh, even if it's like a meetup. Um, of people trying to learn coding, start your own with a few friends. Um, I think doing this with other people, even if you can soak up a lot of the kind of online resources, having a local physical community of people that you can interact with and ask questions to and kind of just sit next to each other while you bang your heads against the wall, hopefully not literally, but that happens while you're programming, I think that's my best advice. Um, um, all right, um, now, <laughs> back to this. 
So um, with when I have a multi-part, when, when I have a, a regular coding challenge that's not multi-part, and I just go to say uh, Langton's Ant, and I click on here, we can find uh, community contributions on this page, and there's information for how to submit your own. So I'm not 100% sure what the best thing to do with these four-part coding challenges are, but right now I think my my um, I would say it either makes the most sense for everybody to like put their community ones in part four or part one. Let's just go with part one for right now, because I think that's what I said. And we can see, ah, look at this. There are one, two, three, four uh, community contributions. Let's try to click through these really quickly. One, two, three, four. And I haven't looked at these. I mean, I, I did look at these. So this is a Discord 2048 game. That's nuts. So if you don't, if you're not aware of what's actually going on here, Discord is like some kind of, you know, I'm like an old person who still, if I could just find my um, <laughs> parchment, I might be able to communicate with people. But apparently Discord, I think, is a platform for real-time communication and chat. And uh, I, I, I use Slack, for example, as a, a uh, messaging community for the patrons of the coding train. I, we, I could use Discord, I suppose. Um, and it looks like there's a way of playing the 2048 game inside Discord, which is, that's pretty wild. I'm gonna have to look into that. Uh, wow. Uh, this is a variation. It looks like it's very similar to mine, but looks much nicer. <laughs> uh, and I, I, I apologize, I'm not crediting the people. The first, the Discord was from Peter. The, this one with added colors, I believe, that's from Isaac. And this one here, oh, look at this. I love this, this I really wanna do. I wanna get to the point where I have some algorithms for playing the game automatically, and I'm just gonna turn this on now, and it just played 50 turns. <laughs> <laughs> Can I have it play 50 turns again? Oh, ah! <laughs> Apparently this 2048 game <laughs> launches a video of me, tiny. That, that, okay, so thank you to, uh, I have a feeling you know who that was. Matthew, thank you for that. And the last one from O.L. Bach, uh, 2048 with variable grid size. So this was certainly a fault. I know fault is the wrong word, but a limitation of the 2048 game that I made uh, where I couldn't do this. If I had to say 10 by 10, and now all of a sudden I have a 10 by 10, and I, I could also make it so that I win. Right here, you can see I could make it so that I win whenever I get to 16. Let's do that. Can I possibly get to 16? Yes! I made it to, I scored 44 points and made it to 16. This is great. So you can see, the things that were missing from my tutorial really are a lot of the window dressing, so to speak, to, that, that make actually the experience of playing a game enjoyable. It, those are almost, you know, those are vital to the, the sort of user experience and, and the language and design of that. Okay. Um, so I think now that's all of my pre, who am I logged in as? I'm logged in as the coding train. Let me see if I can very quickly just tweet here, live now. Uh, the coding train live, um, working with uh, is I think the quick draw data set is from Google Creative Labs. Yes. Uh, made with some friends from Google. It's got to be Creative Labs, right? Um, creative Labs. Is this the Google Creative Labs? What's the chance that's Google Creative Labs? Is this, this is what I'm doing, by the way. Now I'm trying to like tweet that I'm live streaming while I'm live streaming. Creative Labs. No, that's something different. All right, never mind. Forget it. <laughs> Somebody just tweet that I'm live streaming, I'm gonna do, uh, and I'll retweet it from my at Schiffman. <laughs> just somebody quickly tweet me at Schiffman about how I'm gonna do a doodle classification with the quick draw uh, data set today. And I'll just, I'm looking over here, um, and I will, um, I will wait for that tweet to come in, and then I'll be able to retweet it, and that way, <laughs> I, uh, I, don't, I, don't, I, I didn't forget. And, and you keep the link to the coding train slash live in there for people. All right. Uh, let's see how this is doing. How are we doing here? 
eight. Very nice. Okay. Let's make ourselves a nice little cat. That's, that really doesn't look like a cat, does it? Does that look like a cat? <laughs> Welcome to the internet, where you, a person sitting somewhere, is watching somebody attempt to draw in an HTML5 canvas a cat, but the per said person is just really incapable of drawing, has no talent whatsoever, and made a sad cat. All right. All right. What? Oh, did we break Twitter? Wait, hold on, I'm not kidding. Do you see this? Look, did we break Twitter just for my like asking people to tweet at me? Because it says something is wrong. It came back. Okay, good. Fiery Feather. Thank you. Fiery Feather. Here we go. Live now. Okay, thank you, Fiery Feather. All right, so now, is this on? Yes. Um, so this is old from, I'm gonna erase, erase this. All right, so just to give you a quick summary of what I'm going to do, I am going to build a simple MNIST classifier, but I'm not going to use MNIST. I'm going to use Google Quick Draw Drawings. Um, I'm going to use my toy neural network library that I built and um, some things that I want to make sure that I cover during this. So I want to make sure I talk about uh, soft max and cross entropy. Um, so this is probably not something I'm going to tackle today, but as, after I get through this using the toy neural network as is, I probably want to add this. And if this does, if you have no idea what this is, yeah, neither <laughs> do I. I mean, at least neither did I like two days ago. I mean, I sort of did, but I, I've been trying to read and understand it better. Uh, so I will get to that. I don't know why I put a one there. Cause these, um, um, I don't really have, a, I don't, I'm not sort of doing these in numeric order. Um, I think an important thing to make sure I talk about is uh, overfitting and then, of course, uh, underfitting. Um, I want to talk about uh, training versus testing. And that really also falls under uh, supervised learning. Um, what are some other important concepts? If you're, if you're watching this, and I know I just <laughs> wrote off the top, but that's fine. Uh, if you're watching this and you watched my neural Build a Neural Network playlist all the way from beginning to end, what I'm looking here is to create a scenario that uses all of that and then sort of, A, is maybe something that somebody could do something creative and fun with after, but also kind of touches on important themes and pieces of machine learning that I didn't get to. And I just got a notification. Um, beware the upper limit of the screen. Yes. Uh, um, softmax, okay, hold on, wait, I'm looking at these, yep. Yeah, um, this is totally off topic, but Meriden in the uh, chat, YouTube used to be incredibly strict about the um, channel names, but you can, you can actually, I mean, maybe I've reached some threshold where they let me do it, but um, I'm able to, I could change my channel name now pretty easily. Um, check your Twitter feed. I sent a small P5 firework program. Okay, I will look at that. Um, all right. Um, okay. I'm sorry, Ellen, that you have to go as well. Uh, all right. All right. I'm not seeing anything that I'm horrifically missing from this list. 
or that I'm just not like slightly missing from the list. Let me. Th there was something else I wanted to just say here before I get started. Um, oh yes. So, Google, YouTube. It's all the same. Everything is Google. <laughs> help! Help! My whole life it's being swallowed. Get me out of there. <clears throat> I mean, uh, hi. Uh, YouTube had released a whole bunch of new live streaming features and I, I kind of like glanced at them and it seems like, hmm, okay, I think thumbs up. <laughs> but uh, one of which, which I definitely felt excited about is apparently this live chat that is going on right now will be preserved. <laughs> so previously, up until today, every single live stream that I've ever done, I have never been able to go back and read the chat afterwards. So I'm actually planning to do that. It's the kind of, I, it's the kind of thing that I definitely would do. And maybe after I do it, I will decide, oh, I better not do that again because it'll just make me feel sad. But hopefully it'll be nice. Um, so uh, I just want to mention that that's a new feature. They also, uh, the other thing that I understand is they um, have added, they've created their own uh, IFTTT, if this, then that, and otherwise maybe perhaps, uh, I don't know, I might try this other thing. That's, I think that's what it stands for. Um, so I think I can do like weird stuff that if someone does a super chat, you know, and then my Philips branded light bulb, oops, not a sponsor, did I buzz market something? My, uh, some sort of like light bulb would go off or like a little confetti cannon would burst or something. So I, I'm, I would love to uh, figure out ways to make this experience more interactive and fun. Uh, one thing that I have going right now is if anybody in the patron group is in Slack, at me, on uh, in the live channel in the Slack group, I will get my watch will buzz. <laughs> so that usually is useful if like my mic cuts out or something. Um, um, but um, anyway, but I don't love the idea of like, oh, you have to pay this money to make the thing happen. So anyway, I will explore and look into all that, but let's see. What's with the cat? That's what's gonna have, that's what I'm going to explain next. Um, all right, so we are getting there. Let me prepare some URLs. So I need this one. Oops. Oh, the, thank you for asking. Solon writes, so here's the thing. Um, um, thank you for asking about this. Solon asks, any news on my pull request for visualizing the neural network? So I have to apologize. Um, I have not, uh, uh, there's a couple of reasons. I have not gone through and merged any of the pull requests and I'm kind of amazed and overwhelmed by them. There's a couple of reasons for that. Number one is, I um, it's honestly just have really like I haven't been able to make the time to do it thoughtfully, and I don't want to just like do it willy nilly. Um, <laughs> but but this is me. I mean, I was trying to say this in a way. It's not like oh, I'm so busy. I'm gonna look at it. But it just it hasn't been. I haven't been able to get to it. Uh, that's the reason number one. The other reason is I'm I'm not sure. I kind of I I want. I haven't figured out the right balance between having the project progress with community contributions, but still having it be something that if someone's watching the video tutorials, they can look at and follow. So some of the pull requests are so wonderful, but they've really re-engineered in a significant way. And if I haven't covered that aspect of it in a video tutorial, I'm not sure that I, I'm ready to merge it into the library yet. And there might be some way that I could be more clever about different branches or um, that sort of thing. But the, uh, the other thing is, I, I'm not sure, uh, one, a couple of the pull requests which are amazing are about adding uh, multiple hidden layers. And one of the things that I'm really doing this for is because I, I really want to get to evolving a neural network with a genetic algorithm so that I can do some uh, stuff with like agent modeling and training agents to do certain things. Um, and so I feel like the one hidden layer is going to make that much simpler, but maybe, anyway, so I just really haven't figured this all out yet. And um, I'm hoping to continue to figure it out. So my apologies, my apologies to those of you who have submitted pull requests. I really appreciate them. I have looked at all of them. I just haven't figured out about merging them. Uh, all right. <laughs> I 
Philip asked, how long until he actually starts with the main content when he is not in a hurry as today? See, I feel like I'm not in a hurry today because I know I'm going to come back later. But yeah, I'm, I'm bad. I don't, don't watch my channel. It, uh, I, I don't get to stuff quickly. That's for sure. All right, but I'm going to get started now. I've got to get started now. All right, so I've got quick draw. I've got my little silly MNIST thing. I have got quick draw data set. I'm going to open up processing. If you believe this, I'm going to use processing, not for the ultimate example, but at the beginning. I'm going to do this. Okay. Um, quick draw, quick draw data set. Uh, my MNIST thing, and here. And then toy neural network. I think these are all the URLs I need. Look at this. 23 pull requests. Amazing. Um, okay. This is the main. This is the main. How, how do you know when it's the main content? <laughs> ah, except for the fact that this is really bad. Yeah, it's a little bit better. All aboard. It's time for. The coding train is really loud and it's kind of like a piercing sound. I need a different, like, friendlier, like the train is pulling into the station sound. Um, it's pulling into the station. We are going to begin. And we will start here. <laughs> Hello. Oh, wait, let me think here. So this is going to be, oh, hold on. Sorry. I know. Yeah, you really thought I was about to get started, didn't you? That was nice of you to think that. Wouldn't that be nice? Um, so where is this going to go? That's what I have to say. So I don't think, I, this is not a coding challenge because I, I now I realize I tried to do it in a coding challenge. It's going to need to be like six, seven parts. It's more like a series. I think that this series Hello, welcome. is already ridiculously long. It's 18 videos plus this, which is fine. So this either needs to be 11, like nature of code 11, or I do have that. Um, I'm not logged in as myself. I do have, um, I do have the intelligence and learning thing. If I go to playlists, let's see what that is. Session four is neural networks. Is there a session five? <laughs> How do I find? Like all the intelligence and playlists, session three. Let's look for session five. Session five. Session five word, but that's from the A to Z class. So I think this is session four. That was the end Hello, of well when I started, and that's all the neural network stuff. So maybe maybe this is like session five of intelligence and learning, session eleven of nature of code. I don't know. Mathieu, I will, and I will take your advice. But this is, I think this is the start. This is, or this is its own playlist. Okay. okay. I'm really starting now. I swear. I swear. I swear I'm starting. <laughs> I don't know why I feel like I have to leave. Hello. Welcome to a new uh, series of videos and over the course of fill in the blank uh, number of parts. I don't know, probably, it's, I, I would guess, you know, it's maybe going to be 71 hours and 632 parts. Um, <laughs> this is my one mulligan for the day. I promise. I, I like to do this once at the beginning. Hello, welcome to a new uh, video series. In this video series, I'm going to build something. That thing is going to be a doodle classifier. In other words, you might be familiar with something called MNIST. You might have heard of MNIST. It's the MNIST database of handwritten digits. This is a very famous, uh, classic, hello world, if you will, a data set for machine learning to test an algorithm, 
to see how it works, even to teach about machine learning. Um, it, is, uh, it is divided into training and test data. I will talk about that during the course of these videos, but it is a database of handwritten digits. Here is a, and you can see it, um, if, I, if I say no loop here in the console really quickly, you can see there is a zero. It is labeled in the database as a zero. Now, what I have over here is my beautiful drawing of a wonderful kitty cat, which, by the way, my example of trying to guess what digit that kitty cat is, it guessed it as a two. So what I want to do in this series, um, you can find my MNIST example, it's not in a video series, but it's there in the GitHub repository, is I want to build from the very beginning a MNIST style classifier, but instead of classifying digits, I want to classify doodles. So I want to know, is that a cat you drew, or a puppy, or a rainbow, or something else? And how am I going to do this? I am going to do this with um, the Google Quick Draw data set. Ah, so Quick Draw is a project, I believe, from Google Creative Labs. Uh, and let's just play it for a second. Let's draw. Draw an octagon in under 20 seconds. Oh my god. One. Two, three, four, five. Ah, I'm so stressed out. <laughs> Six, seven, eight. All right. Ah, okay. This is way too stressful for me. And it started talking to me. I don't know if you could hear that. Um, I don't. I don't got it. I don't got it. So. This is a game that you can play, and as you play it, a machine learning system tries to guess what you're drawing. And it just so happens that, um, uh, let me find quick draw data set. I don't know what I'm looking for here. Um, well, that I already have that, sorry. Ah, quick draw data. It just so happens that people playing this game, Google collected 50 million drawings across 345 different categories. And all of that data is available to you. And in fact, um, ah, this is what I'm looking for. I could go to, you could, and I could browse the drawings here. So I could say like, let me look at all of the cellos. And you can see these are millions and millions of different cellos that people have drawn. And I have access to all this data. Now what's really interesting is that in addition to just having the image itself here, like, oh look, I can see it on my screen. The system saved the vector path of the drawing itself. So there's a lot that you could do with it in thinking about the sequence of how it's drawn. And that's something I hope to get to at some point in a future video. But in this example, I am going to treat these as little bitmapped images. I'm just going to use a little snapshot of each drawing. That's going to be the data associated with a given classification, also known as label or class. This is a 28 by 28 pixel cello. Now, this is not my own genius idea because I don't have any of those, <laughs> definitely not. Um, MNIST Google Quick Draw. This idea came from this blog post by Rajiv Shah using Google's Quick Draw to create an MNIST style data set. You can follow along and there's information about how to do this. All of this is looking at how to do this in Python. Um, I believe, I don't know if it then goes on to use TensorFlow or what, or if it's just actually showing you how to get the data, but I'm going to sort of do this on my own and I'm going to use processing and to, to parse and work with the data and P5JS to then do the neural network magic stuff. Okay? Are you with me? Are you going to watch this? So, the first video, this is like my introduction to the idea, and in the next video I'm going to start working with the data, but let's do, let's go, let's go a little further by way of introduction. So how is this going to work? And so one thing I want to mention is that I already have, the, the, I'm going to be able to do this because I have built something, and there's a whole video series that you can watch, uh, where I build, it's about 10, or it's like 18 <laughs> videos long, Toy Neural Network. This is a JavaScript implementation of a simple neural network. Now eventually, if, if in the great future beyond, when you're watching this in the year 7500 from your gelatinous tube, <laughs> um, uh, I will hopefully have also completed this same demonstration or similar demonstrations using something called ML5, which is built on top of something called deeplearn.js. So deeplearn.js is a project also from a Google research group, which is an implementation of deep learning 
in the browser, hardware accelerated with the GPU. Doesn't that sound fancy? <laughs> so basically, it's a highly optimized uh, way of doing a lot of stuff where you have really big data sets and you need to do stuff faster and, and in a more robust fashion. For me, right now, I want to demonstrate the core concepts and using this sort of like simple toy library is, is not going to produce the quote unquote best results, but I, I'm hoping it produces the best results for learning at this point, and we can, I'm going to get to this stuff after that. Okay, that's number one. <laughs> so assuming I have that, that means I don't have to, in the course of these videos, write the code for the so-called neural network. The neural network is going to be the thing that sits in the middle. Something has to go into it, some set of input, something has to come out of it, some set of output. Now, I should mention that to do machine learning, to say like, oh, here's some data, I'm going to give it to you, please give me, <laughs> I should say that to do machine learning, uh, in the sense of like, here's some data, please do something with this, analyze this data for me, do some math with it, and then give me some information about it back. A neural network is not the only thing that can sit in between input and output. And you might have seen other videos that I've done about, you know, K nearest neighbor. There's things like support vector machines, uh, decision trees. There are lots of other machine learning algorithms for this, for this case, for this learning process, and for some of the other examples where neural networks perform really well that I hope to get to. That's what's sitting in here. So what I need, if I have that already from my library, what I need is to figure out what are my inputs and what are my outputs. In this case, my input is going to be, did I write off the top of the board? Oh, it's not so bad, it's not so bad, okay. Uh, slightly too high on the wall, okay. Uh, did I have any like horrible, I'm, I'm seeing that, well, hold on, we can, uh, I think it's fine. There wasn't anything in those drawings that was really awful, was there? I shouldn't have picked cello, I guess. Anyway. Um, <laughs> Coming back to this, all right. I am going to use a 28 by 28 pixel image. Maybe it is said doodle of a cat, right? And that is going to be my input into the system. Now, if you've watched my previous videos, what you'll typically see, and this will change as we get to more sophisticated Mach uh, machine learning architectures. In particular, I just want to like foreshadow this, something called a convolutional network, which is really designed to work with images. I'm not doing that yet. This needs to be flattened, and it needs to be flattened into what's often referred to as a vector or a one column matrix. So I need to take this data, it's an image, and convert it to a list of numbers. This is this is, the, this is probably, in many ways, the most important thing that you need to do when you're working with machine learning. It's like, well, what is my data? How do I format it? And, and there's lots of other questions about it as well. So well, I'm gonna come to that, but let's just think about this. This is a pretty, this, there's a way that I can do this. I'm not saying it's the quote unquote best way, but there's a, certainly a simple way. Each one of these pixels has a brightness value. That brightness value is somewhere between zero and 255. I can normalize it because it helps to have your inputs have kind of a smaller range of low numbers. I can normalize that by dividing by 255 to range from 0 to 1. And then now 28 by 28 is 785, 784 pixels. I now have, you know, uh, 1, you know, 0 0.7, 0 0.6. So this will become my inputs. I need to look at the images, I need to convert it into an array of floating point numbers normalized between zero and one, and that becomes the input to the neural network system. And if you look at the neural network library, it's actually, that's what it's asking you to pass into a train function or a predict function. Give me an array of numbers. Okay, let's, let's pause here for a second, because I want to go to the outputs, but I really have to say something, something that I think is super important. Time out for a second. I want to point to somebody's research um, that I, um, Mimi Onu, Onuoha, mm, I wish I knew how to pronounce her name correctly. Uh, a miss, I want to go here to missing data sets. Um, okay. So, um, Uh, 
All right, sorry, I'm looking. Okay, so I just, I, I think this is important to say. I want to take a moment here just to say that b this video series, for what I'm doing, I'm really trying to focus on the sort of, <laughs> I was going to say the learning process, but what I mean by that, your learning process. Learning about how this stuff works, how to build software that uses it. Okay. <laughs> These suggestions, <laughs> I only want you to notify me if it's an emergency. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, let, me start, let me start over again. Um, I'm just, I'm joking around with you guys. It's, it's, it's totally fine. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm awkwardly trying to figure out how to fit this little piece that I want to talk about into this video, and I'm going to attempt again. All right, so I want to just take a brief, brief pause here for a second, uh, and I want to get to the outputs. But before I do that, something really, there's something really important here. So while the purpose of these video tutorials that you're watching that I'm making is probably primarily the, le the learning process, what I mean by that is your learning process, and I'm just creating a kind of arbitrary scenario that's somewhat interesting to see if, how this stuff works, you really, if, you really, if you're working with machine learning in these systems, it's really important for you to ask yourself, should I be doing what I'm doing? Is what I'm doing ethical? Am I hurting someone? Did I, what is this data set that I'm using? What's missing in the data set? So we think about it. This, we could say, okay, well, I'm just building a doodle classifier. You know, what's the worst thing that's gonna happen? But I think as a useful exercise to yourself, you might think about who is not, rep what is not represented in that doodle data set. So I would love to come back to this as a topic about how to collect data and think about data and bias and algorithms in a more substantive way. I will just take a moment to point you to the research of uh, Mimi Onuoha, um, who uh, runs a project called Missing Data Sets. Um, and I uh, encourage you to check out her website and a lot of her work around uh, missing data and ways that people are abstracted, represented, and classified. So um, that said, let me come back now to the next piece, <laughs> output. So if our input is pixels and we've taken all of those brightness values and normalized them to zero through one, we now need an output. Now, here's the thing. What am I trying to do? In the case of the handwritten digits, I'm trying to say, is it a zero, is it a one, is it a two, is it a three, blah, 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 blah. In this case, I'm trying to say, is it a kitty cat? Is it a rainbow? Is it a unicorn? Is it a cupcake? All of these wonderful things. Is it a heart? Maybe there'll be some hearts. I want to, so let's just say I'm going, we have to make a decision here. Let's just say I'm only going to use three kinds of doodles. In that case, my outputs, what I want is also a vector, a one column matrix, a list of numbers, and I want those numbers to represent the probability that this particular image is any one of those given categories. For example, if it's, uh, if it's a kitty cat instead of a rainbow or a cupcake, maybe I want it to give me that output. If it is a rainbow, maybe I want it to give me this output. If it is a cupcake, maybe I want it to give me that output. In reality, we're probably going to see something that looks, when the, when the neural network itself is guessing, we're going to see something that looks more like you know, 0 0.8, 0 0.1, 0 0.1. And in theory, we want all of these to add up to 100%. Now, the first time I do this, as I begin, it's probably not going to do that, but at, at some point towards the very end of this playlist, I'm going to get to something called softmax, which is an algorithm for guaranteeing that the output of a neural network, everything adds up to 100% probability. So we'll come back to that at some point. Okay, this is the main idea. And so what we have going on here is a supervised learning process. And by that, I mean we have this data set. It is labeled. I have the data from Google. I have all those drawings. So I'm going to give the neural network, I'm going to say, here's a drawing of a kitty cat. 
I expect you to say to me, 100, if you give me an incorrect answer, I'm going to ask you to adjust all your little parameters inside of your cute little, cute little parameters, weights and things inside of your neural network and uh, try again. And we're going to do this over and over and over again. That's supervised learning. Here's known data. Here's known data. Here's known data. We've got to do that for quite a while before we are ready to then say, now I'm going to draw my own kitty cat for you. What do you think? <laughs> Neural network, do you like it? Um, so that's the idea. But there's an important piece of this. When I go to get the data, one thing that I want to do is that I want to make sure that in addition to training data, let's say I take 1,000 kitty cat drawings. I want to save some amount of it. You know, maybe a typical amount you might save is 20%. So I might save 200 of those drawings and, and only use 800 in the training process and save 200 of them for testing. Meaning, how can I know whether my machine learning algorithm is working well? Well, if I just test it to see if it's getting the right answers for the drawings I've trained it with, I might be stuck with something called overfitting. Overfitting refers to when, almost like the neural network is doing such a good job, it's trained itself so well that it's so highly optimized and tuned to the stuff that you trained it with that it, it can't really deal with stuff that it's not trained with. And that's something we have to watch out for. Now, there are techniques to fight against that. Um, something I'm going to maybe come back to in another video is like something called dropout, and there's more and more things. But one way we can at least sort of test ourselves that we're hopefully not overfitting is by running data that it wasn't trained on and seeing how well it performed. How many do I get correct out of those 200 after I've trained it? So this is what I need to do. So that's by way of introduction. Then the next video, what I'm going to do is download a bunch of drawings, prepare them and get them ready because it's work, by the way, preparing, cleaning, normalizing, thinking about uh, your data is just is a big is a project unto itself. Right? Machine learning isn't just some magic that you do and you just say sprinkle the data on it and now I'm done. You've really got to be thoughtful about that data. And so let's, I'm going to hopefully, hopefully I will be somewhat thoughtful about the data in the next video. Okay? See you soon. Um, all right. The lowest vector is partially out of the whiteboard. Oh. Poopy pants. <laughs> I think it's fine. <laughs> Was that, that's not, you know, you, people got the idea, right? Zero, zero, one. You can imagine there's a one down here, right? Right? I mean, Mathieu, you can do some, if you want, you could do some post-production magic, but I think it's okay. Uh, Wait, plus one for K Weekman to be YouTube modded, FYI, while you're looking. Yes. Uh, do I have to do that? Nobody else can do that. Let me find a message. What is love? Don't hurt me. Oh. Add moderator. Ka ching, ka ching, ka ching. That is correct, Muhammad. I am a teacher. <laughs> How long I will continue to have a job as a teacher remains to be seen, but for right now, I'm hoping all this YouTube stuff will eventually get me fired. I should be so lucky. Okay, wrong screen at the moment. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> all right, I think this was good. It is now 11.34. I think I can go forth to the next piece of this. Oh, I am excited. I, see, I feel so much better about this already because certain topics really require just like some, take your time, go through them, think about them. And when I'm like, I'm gonna do a cutting challenge, do the classification, it's just like, I don't allow myself, if I know it's gonna be multiple parts. Yeah, all right. Um, I, I'm, uh, apologies to Mimi O, who I'm sure I mispronounced her name. Her work is, Amazing. Um, okay, this I don't need anymore. This I will keep. This keep. Okay. All right.
We're gonna, we're gonna, this is going to go away now. This is going to go away now. And this is going to stay here. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah. These are fine. I didn't show anything that's like somebody got their obnoxious, trollish cello drawing in here, right? I shouldn't have picked cello. Let's go. So first of all, let me think about this. What do I want? There's so many. Oh, bird. Definitely like the bird. Is there a rainbow? Um, let me just go to the open sourcing of them. Uh, the raw moderated data set, pre-processed data set. I think I want the pre-processed data set. Okay. Um, Yeah, I want the pre-processed. So where is, I just want to have these links ready so I'm not like looking for them. Where's the Google Cloud link? Let's see if this takes me there. No, that's just the documentation. That's not what I want. Get the data. Uh, yeah, this is wrong. Uh, Come on, get me the data. Where's that Google Cloud, Cloud Console? There we go, this is what I'm looking for. Uh, let's see, please email me, no. I agree that my use of any services and related APIs is subject to my compliance with the applicable All right, everybody. Now, as you know, I always read the terms of service. So before I click yes, you're just going to have to bear with me. <clears throat> oh my God. <laughs> Which one do I read? Wait, hold on. Service is with the applicable terms of service. Oh wait, maybe it's this one? <laughs> my joke, how long can I keep this joke up? Because, uh, uh, you know, I'm just going to click yes, but I wanted to, uh, services and related APIs. Services and, oh no, this is all, okay, wait, quick draw? Which, I don't know which, do I, do I, do I, I have to read all of these, don't I? Because I just don't know which one it is. Google Cloud, Big Data, Big Tip, Blogger, <laughs> I think that went off. Cloud APIs, Cloud Data Store API. Oh wait, oh no, these are all, oh no, this is which one? Oh good, Google Cloud. <laughs> Maybe I need a machine learning algorithm to tell me which one of these terms of services I need to read. <laughs> okay, hold on. <clears throat> let's, let's read the uh, cloud platform. <clears throat> and let's, let, I think it's more appropriate if we sing it. The Google Cloud Platform Terms of Service, last modified February 8th, 2018. If you are accessing the Google Cloud Platform Services as a customer of the Google Cloud Platform Reseller, the terms below do, do, do not apply to your reseller governs your use of the Google Cloud Platform Services. If your billing account is in India, please research. Oh, no, I'm not in India, Brazil, no. Don't, don't speak Portuguese, sorry. The Google Cloud Platform license agreement, the agreement is made and entered into by and between Google and the entity are person agreeing to these terms. Customer Google means either one Google Commerce Limited, GCL, a company incorporated under the laws of Ireland with offices at the Gordon House, Barrow Street, Dublin 4. Ireland, if customer has a billing address in the EU and has chosen non-business as <sighs> All right, fine. You got me. You got me, Google. Have my children. Take it all.
Okay, uh, where was I? <laughs> uh, there we go. Now, <clears throat> ooh, sign up for a free trial and you'll get $300 in credit and 12 months to explore Google Cloud platform. No, no, anyway, okay. Um, all right, so I need this link open. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think I'm going to start a new YouTube channel, which is just singing terms of service. Somebody ping um, Sam Levine. I think this could be good for, uh, for, um, <clears throat> for stuff that he's working on. Okay. Um, so let me close all these, um, and I'm here. Okay, so I have, I told, I really have no idea what's going on anymore. I completely lost my train of thought. Train of thought. Okay, so, and I have to go soon, so I better get moving on this. All right, I'm gonna open up processing, which I did already, and I am going to talk about the data. Um, okay. Cat, there we go. Oh, look at this. It even says where it was drawn. Interesting. Okay. All right, here we go. Rainbows and tr there's rainbows and trains. Okay. Well, hello. So let's just do cat, because that's kind of ubiquitous. A rainbow and a train. I think that'll probably be good, right? And we'll do three categories. It's important to do more than two, but I don't want to do too many. Okay. Where are the trains? Where are the trains? Somebody tell me where the trains are. I see ambulance. Oh, just go with the cat. Okay. All right, I'm back. And in this video, I am now going to look at how to actually make use of this data set. Just as a reminder, this is the quick draw data set. By the way, there is so much goofy, fun, creative, interesting things you could do with this data set that have nothing to do with this whole machine learning, neural network nonsense stuff. So hopefully this video will be useful for you anyway and encourage you to make creative projects with the data set. And I will try to link in the video's description to some projects that other people have made. Um, but let's talk about how I'm gonna get access to this data and use it. So one thing we know, here's all the kitty cats. And we can say, look, well, I really like this one. So I'm gonna look at uh, this one, click on it. So one thing you'll notice, it's got a number. It actually is, uh, it's got a, um, it's, it has a date when it was drawn and what country it was drawn from, which is interesting, by the way, in light of my discussion of missing data sets and the work of Mimi O that I talked about a little bit in the previous video, thinking about when you're working with a data set, where does it come from? Who collected it? What's missing from that data set? Why are you using it? Is what you're using it with going to hurt somebody? Think about these questions. Now, fortunately for us, I think we're just gonna make a fun, goofy drawing thing, and I think we're gonna be okay, but those are really key and important questions. Now, this is a nice little interface to look at the data. On GitHub, however, I can go to GitHub Quick Draw Data Set, and here's the documentation for what kind of formats the data is actually in. So if I scroll down here for a little bit, we can see the data is actually available in these ndjson files. And what's interesting about this is you can see like, oh look, there's an ID. Every single drawing has a unique identifier, and I, I know I'm standing in front of some of this, so let me move this over. Um, it has uh, a word, which I would assume is the category. Yes, what the, what the player of the game said, will you please draw this? Um, and when it was created, what country, and then the drawing itself. And look at this, look at all these numbers. What are those numbers? So if you remember from my previous video, what I'm trying to do is do image classification with a simple 28 by 28 pixel image, but the data itself is actually all of the vector points, the path of the drawing. And that's why when I'm on this page, as I hover over it, you can actually see a replay of how the thing was drawn itself. So that's something I would hope to come back and make a future video about using that data. But what I actually want to use, I'm gonna go back to here, is a different way that the data is formatted. So there, you can go in here, there's binary files, but this is what I want, NumPy bitmaps. 
So a NumPy bitmap is a special data format that stores all of the pixels of a bitmap version of the drawing in a format that the Python library NumPy can read very easily with np.load. Now, if I were a person who lived in the regular world, I would see this and go, oh, perfect. I'm just going to go and do my project with NumPy because that's what people do. But I am a person who lives in this weird world of wanting to do things in JavaScript and in the browser and sometimes in processing. So what I want to do in this video is look at how I can get access to the NumPy bitmapped data format in an environment that's not NumPy and then kind of clean or normalize or organize the data in such a way that I can use it for my machine learning doodle classification project. All right, so let's get the data. If you click through and read this documentation, you'll find that it is here. The data is available on the Google Cloud platform. Uh, <laughs> if you want to listen to me, uh, never mind. I was, I was thinking a song earlier that I think I shall not speak about. Um, and so these are all the different formats. I'm going to go here under NumPy bitmap. And I'm going to see, OK, look at this. Now, I think we have to start with rainbow. I probably should start with train, but let's this is not a very effective way to get to it. Let's just make a little edit point here. Uh, da, 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 da. Oh, guess what? <laughs> All right, so I'm going to get the rainbow.npy file. And it's downloading. It's a very large file. It is about 100 megabytes. So I don't know how many drawings are in that exactly. Uh, we're going to figure that out when I open up the file. But what I want to do is make for myself, I want to make a little simple uh, training and testing set with just a thousand drawings in it. Again, to do this kind of work effectively, the more data I have, probably the better, but to demonstrate it in a quick and friendly way in a YouTube video, using a small data set is probably going to be best. And then you, the viewer, could take my code, do something with it, kind of expand the data set. All right. So it should have downloaded by now. I'm going to work with pre-processing this data in the processing programming environment, which is a Java-based platform. Um, I could do this <laughs> in Python. I could actually go directly to JavaScript now. But I'm just doing this to demonstrate it. And it's kind of what I would do, because I know processing the best, probably. So I'm going to just make a little uh, a f sketch called Quick Draw Data. Let me put it on the desktop. Um, I'm going to open up the sketch folder, and I'm going to grab this file and put it in there. In theory, what I should do is probably uh, make a folder called data and put it in, uh, put it in there. And then I, I'm just going to rename it. It has a long name. I'm going to rename it to rainbow.npy. Okay. So now, processing, one of the reasons why I picked processing is it has a function called load bytes. Oh, you cannot see that at all. Look at that. You cannot see that at all unless I do this. Hold on a sec. Pause. How's that? Too big? Just right? I think I can make it smaller, right? Is that okay? Okay, great. Okay, so I'm going to use the load bytes function, and I'm going to say <laughs> I was about to say let, but I'm going to say byte. Uh, I'm going to say uh, byte. Boy, I've forgotten how to program in Java. Byte data equals load bytes. Rainbow.npy. So this is a nice little function. Let me bring the console up here because I'm on a console, uh, print stuff to the console. Let's just say print line data dot length. So I'm going to run this. And we can see, look at that. That data, that array, I now have the, the 99 million bytes. So interestingly, let's try to figure out how many images that is. Well, I know that each image is 28 by 28. And so that's 784 total. So total equals data.length 
divided by 784, and let's see what we get. Now, I really should do this as a floating point to, sh whoa, and let's, <laughs> let's print line uh, total. So that's about 126,000 images. Now the thing is, this isn't actually correct. And if I wanted to do some research, most data files will actually have bytes at the beginning that aren't the data you want, but are something called header bytes. And those header bytes describe the data, like this is what's in here, this is what format it is, this is how much of it there is. And what I probably should do is look at the NumPy um, binary file uh, data format. If I Google that, I'm going to get somewhere, I'm going to get some page that explains the NPY. I should have just scratched that. I should have just uh, looked for NPY file format. And I'm going to find some information about how it's formatted. Now, here's the thing. I looked at this yesterday, and I happen to know that there's about 80 extra bytes on the beginning. <laughs> Not about, exactly 80 extra bytes. So what I'm actually going to say is data.length minus 80 because that's how many bytes that are actually in that array that have to do with the pixels. And we're going to see that's exactly how many, 126,000 images. So let's just see if everything's going correctly, we could at least look at the first one. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a variable called start. I'm going to say start at 80. And then I'm going to look at 784 bytes. And the index is i plus 80. And what I want to do is also create, let me make an image that is 28 by 28. Let me load the pixels of that image because I'm going to write the bytes into an image so I can look at it. And then I'm going to say int val equals, now we're going to run into an issue, but I'll fix it. <laughs> Anticipating things. Oh, and I need to say RGB. So when I say create image, I've got to say RGB. So value equals, uh, what did I call it? Just data, data. Oh, and this should be plus start. Data index, uh, data index. That's the value. And then I want to say image dot pixels. I equals that value. Then I want to say image dot update pixels. And then I want to just draw that image. Image zero zero. Look at that. Oh, is that really a rainbow? Maybe I, sh I should have picked something else because I kind of wanted to see, like, is this really right? So that is the first rainbow. Uh, now, something's a little weird. Like, why is there some yellow and some blue? So I haven't, been for, I haven't been very thoughtful about this. One thing that's happening is the byte values that are actually coming in there are signed bytes. So they're going to have be between like negative 127 and positive 127 or something approximately like that. So I can actually apply a... Um, a bitwise operation, and I just sort of like and it with some hexadecimal numbers. <laughs> I could kind of go through that in a different video, but this is going to, ch I believe if I'm doing this correctly, change it from an unsigned byte to a signed byte to give me a range between 0 and 255. So I, I should try to link to a resource about bitwise operations or make one myself at some point. Um, so now you can see, okay, well that's weird. Now it's blue. Well, the reason why it's blue is I'm actually, this is a number between 0 and 255, val is, and I'm setting that number to be the pixel color, but a color is an RGB color. So in processing, if I just wrap this in the color function, it'll take that number and make it into an RGB color with that value as the red, green, and blue value. Okay, so now we should see, there it is, there's somebody's rainbow. All right, so let's get a little further with this now. Let's make a window that's 280 by 280. Uh, let's do this. Let's have, um, let's forget about it. This was just for my own curiosity. Let's say we're going to look at um, 200, 100 images, right? Ten, let's say 10, 10 by 10. So I'm going to say for int n equals 0, n is less than total, n plus plus. We're going to do this. Um, we're going to do this 100 times. And so the start is 80 plus n times 784, right? Because each image is going to start by the 80 header bytes and then how, what image we're on times 784 pixels. So even if I just did this right now, we should see there's the last rainbow. 
<laughs> I just drew them all on top of each other. But now I need to get an x value, which is n modulus 10, right? Because I want the sort of column to be um, uh, modulus 10 meaning the remainder of dividing by 10. So the column goes 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 0, 1, 2, and the um, y value to be n divided by 10. So the, for the first 10, I'm in row 0. For the next 10, I'm in row 1. And so now I should get, ooh, what did I do wrong there? Um, did something wrong. Uh, if I run it again, will it fix it? What did I do wrong here? n modulus 10, n divided by 10. Oh, oh, wait a sec. I'm drawing the stuff in the correct location. I know what the problem is. <laughs> Weird, though. Index is i plus start index image pixels i, hold on a sec, x times width, oh yeah, no, oh yeah, 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 whoops, so I forgot, this should be, well, okay, this should be 28, and these should all be in variables, right, because they're each 28 by 28 pixels wide, so I, I guess I was drawing the last one 10 pixels over, that was the problem. Format, it won't do it for me, okay. There we go, all right, so there are all my rainbows. I don't like how they're white on black, so I'm just going to say uh, 255 minus, and come on, there we go. Rainbows, yay, rainbows, okay. All right, so we've done it. We've accessed the data. I kind of understand how it works. Now what I want to do is save it out into a format that I can easily use in P5. I'm thinking about this. So on the one hand, I could save this uh, to like, I could rewrite the data to like a JSON format that I'm happy with. I'm gonna, uh, weirdly, I think what I want to do is load the data in as binary into JavaScript because I think it's probably worth doing that. As an exercise yourself, you might think about rewriting. It's, it's also processing, it's a bit convoluted to write out a JSON file from processing, although quite possible. So I think for simplicity, what I want to do now is just save bytes. So let's say what I, but what I want to do, whoops. What I want to do is just save a file with only 1,000 images in it, right? It's because I don't want to have to carry with me this 100 megabyte file while I'm just trying to learn and figure this stuff out. So I'd make a much smaller file with just 1,000 in it. And so let's look at how I would do that. So um, I'm going to create a variable. I'm going to call it out data. And it's a new byte array with um, uh, total times 784. And again, <laughs> you know, the thing is, these numbers are never going to change, so I'm kind of happy with just hard coding them in there, but obviously I should refactor and, and make all tw the 28 and the 784. I mean, all I need is that 28, and the 80 should be a variable, but we're going to be fine. So I want to save, I'm going to save out 200, uh, 780, uh, 100 of these images. And so while I'm going through here, I'm just going to do uh, out index is zero. So every time I get a new uh, value, I'm just going to say out data out index e equals that value. And then I'm just going to say out index plus plus. So as I'm going through, I'm just going to write, and this, mm, so this is actually, I made this into an integer so I could use it in processing. I think if I do this, it will be happy with me. Um, I might have the same, anyway, so I think that, that I think is going to be fine. And then what I'm going to do is at the very end, I'm going to say save bytes. Um, what, what is this? Rainbows, 100. I'll, I'll call it dot bin for binary. Rainbows, 100 dot bin uh, and out data. 
So this is a function in processing that will save that array of bytes to a binary file. I'm calling it rainbows100. I'm going to run this. We can see, now I should be able to go to the directory. We can see there it is. And how big is this file? It's just 78 kilobytes. So I have 100 of them in a, just a binary file. But that's not, let's, let's, let's save 1,000 of them. And now that I'm saving it, I think probably there's no reason for me to have the image anymore. So let's, because I, I, the image is just to like sort of see that it works. Um, so let me comment that stuff out. And now I want to save rainbows 1000 and I'm going to run it and there we are. Rainbows1000.bin and this is, this file is um, just 784 kilobytes. So this is really nice because now when I move over to JavaScript, I could kind of use this very like lightweight data file that I can play around with and later I could go get the full NumPy file or, or uh, and I have this processing sketch which just allows me to quickly work with the data and resize it, reformat it, that sort of thing. Um, Okay, so this is now the end of this particular video. In the next video, what I'm going to do is look at loading these data files into JavaScript and dividing them into training and testing, uh, uh, training and testing data sets to, to use them ultimately with the neural network. And in between you watching or me recording this particular video and the next one, I will go ahead and make a bunch more of these. So I will make one for trains and one for cats. I think I'll just do three. I don't know. Maybe when I come back, I'll have picked some different ones. But if, you know, pause if you're watching this as a playlist. Maybe go and play around with this data yourself. Think about how you might draw it in a different way in processing or in, in P5 and have some fun. And I'll see you in the next video. Um, okay. Um, all right. So what are we, how are we on time? Noon. Hmm. So I think, let me do, let me, let me get some more. Um, so let's, um, let's go here. What did we say we want to try train? And actually, even if I'm doing a thousand, I like to be able to see them as it's going. And I wonder if I should rewrite the data as white pixels, I'm a black on white rather than white on black, but um, does this, like even though it made, a, yeah, so actually I should just leave the image stuff in there. Um, so one of the things that's nice about doing this is if I scroll over here, there's this public link and I can do copy link address and I can actually just put that in here. So I can just access it from the URL directly and now I can say, what was this? Trains 1000. Oh, it's going to take a while because it's got to download it. I'm like, why is it taking so long? So it's got to download the file. Uh, great. So these are all the trains. Oh, these are awesome. Uh, wow, these are really, this is probably a poor choice because this is so insane. They're so insanely different, but it'll be interesting. Um, so people are asking, is the stream done? Sorry, I'm doing this in two parts today. So I've got to leave and, and do a bunch of other stuff for a few hours and then I'm going to come back and, and finish. The, I, I, I'm definitely going to finish this project. Whatever finish means, I don't know, but I'm going to get further along. All right, so that's the trains, uh, which cat. Um, let's go put a cat in here. Ugh, the big font. Come on, oops. Oh, I could have just changed this to cat. I don't know why I'm, I'm acting all crazy. And then uh, cats 1000. Oh, we gotta wait. Thank you, Waldir. Uh, how many hours will the stream be back? Uh, uh, look up 3 p.m. Eastern time in your time zone. So that's when I'm hoping to be back is 3 p.m. Um, whoops. Um, so I have rainbows, cats. Right, I'm like, oh look, 
Oh, interesting. Of course it's 784 kilobytes. I didn't even note that. That's really, it's like, this is like really interesting to see. This is like learning about bytes, right? I just saved 784,000 bytes. It's 1,784 pixel images, 784 kilobytes. I didn't have to look that up. Of course it would be 784. Um, okay, thank you, K Weekbond. Okay, so thank you. I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to shout out the super chats because it's really kind of people to do that. Um, oh, that's send a super chat. How do I see them all? I see Waldir Cruz. Thank you. Uh, Tobias von Arks. Uh, will I be making new ones about fractals? Um, um, yeah, I don't, yes. <laughs> I don't have any specific plans to, but of course I would like to at some point. Uh, let's see what else. Did I miss any others? Um, I think I got all of them. I see another one here. Cody, thank the universe for you. Thank you, Cody. Um, I really appreciate that. And, and the super chats are really nice to see. I, I'm very, I'm conflicted about whether to have that feature enabled, but um, I certainly appreciate it. And having the financial support uh, does really help me continue. It motivates me in some ways, uh, as much as I should have my own motivation just through the, the, the enjoyment that I get of doing this, but it, it does really help. Um, but you can also, if you're interested in supporting, you can, you can join the Patreon. Um, all right. So uh, I think I'm ready. Let me... I have like, I mean, I have like 10 minutes. Um, so what could I possibly do in the next 10 minutes before I go? I don't think anything. So I think I should probably just go to then have more time later. And so the, let's just, let me just think about what I need to do this afternoon. So this afternoon, and by the way, let me, I mean, I'll, so one thing, it's possible that I'm going to end up doing this in like three parts today. Um, if that happens, I believe YouTube, so how do you know when I'm live streaming next? Here's a little lesson in YouTube. Go to youtube.com, the coding train. I'm not actually signed in as myself. I'm signed in as some other Google account. And now I need to go and hit subscribe. Uh, I am subscribed already. And then I actually don't do this. I'm going to do this. Click the alarm bell. If you click the alarm bell, YouTube should send you a notification the moment I go live. Um, and at some point I will schedule it, but it will be on exactly this page, youtube.com slash decodingtrain slash live. Um, and I'm seeing K Weekman is typing. <laughs> I will choose not to read. You have to join the Patreon, the Patreon group to read K Weekman's message. Uh, I will take a few questions before I go. Oh wait, Simon did notify me with something that is worth mentioning. Um, I just, uh, that Simon maybe had made something relevant to what I was showing. Ah, so Simon Tiger, uh, github.com slash Simon Tiger slash decision. I mentioned decision trees earlier and Simon Tiger has a library for using decision trees. Whoa, that is so cool. Oh my goodness. I totally want, oh, the camera went off. I totally want to use this. Um, and while we're here, let's take a minute to subscribe to Simon's YouTube channel from this account as well. Whoops. Simon Tiger. No, hold on. Uh, Simon Daniel Schiffman. <laughs> There we go. Uh, we're gonna subscribe. So I highly recommend uh, Simon's YouTube channel. Simon uh, makes amazing videos. This is one of my favorites recently about the magic hexagon. Let's subscribe and click the alarm bell. Subscribe to Simon, okay. Um, sorry, now I missed, now I missed the questions. Shoot. If there are any good questions, please repost them in, uh, in the uh, patron chat. Uh, 
Okay. Will you ever use any other languages besides processing or JavaScript? Sure. If it if it's a thing that I if um I, I mean I do stuff in Python when I ha when I, I do stuff in PHP sometimes I'm working on WordPress. You know, I tend to limit myself to processing and JavaScript for my video tutorials, but if there's something I'm working on where a different programming language environment's really gonna make sense, then I will use it. Um, whoa, three blue, one brown just came out with a new video. I just got a notification. What languages do you teach on school, Dan? Um, I, uh, so I teach um, the same stuff that's in my YouTube channel. That's exactly what I teach in my classes at NYU. Um, how do I get the ideas for the coding challenges? People suggest them. Um, I do have a GitHub repository where you can file an issue to suggest one. Really though, as I'm trying to teach stuff and do stuff along with the courses that I'm doing at NYU. Have you ever thought about using Python? Every day. Um, will you teach us binary code? I need to know it. Hmm, I don't know. I don't even know what that means exactly, but uh, um, at one point I did find that song. It was, I think I got it off Free Music Archive. I have to find it again. Okay, that's the end. So thank you everybody. This is not the end. I mean, it's never the end, but this is not even the end of today's live stream. It is about 12, 10 p.m. Eastern time. I would say about, um, I would say about, um, can P5 be used on web development? Yes. Oh, sorry, I'm so, just my elbow still, I'm oh, sorry, I'm still reading all your questions. I'm sorry, I'll get to the rest of the questions another time. I'll be back in approximately three hours. Um, if you go, at some point I will post a, a time maybe on Twitter, or it will actually on the, uh, again, if you subscribe and click the alarm bell, you'll get a notification. And I usually also like, there's a thing in my interface where I can add a time. Maybe I should just go do that right now. Oh, no, but I can't if I'm live streaming, I think. Anyway, I will add a time. I'll be back approximately 3 p.m. Eastern time. We're gonna finish this doodle classification project, okay? Thank you. I love you too.